Hi, my name's Syra. And my name's Jen. And we are from the learning team here at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery in Oshawa. Today's session is called Spirit of the Lake for grades six to eight. This workshop is inspired by the exhibition called Terra Economicus by Toronto artist Will Kwan. Will Kwan is a Hong Kong born, Toronto based Canadian contemporary artist. Although Will's work is not centrally about indigenous topics, we will be using his artworks as conversation starters to talk about relationships between settlers and indigenous communities. In respect of this, we would like to do a land acknowledgement. Before we do that, you need to understand why we do it. Its purpose is to recognize that we as settlers and as people who are not part of First Nations or indigenous groups are here on their land. Ani Buju and welcome to the ancestral lands and treaty lands of the Mississauga of Scugog Island First Nation and the traditional territory of the Mississauga Nation. Let's go and check out the exhibition. Come with me. Wow, this is really exciting. Look at all the different artworks. Hey, take one of these, Jan. I think it tells you all about it. And it's a really good keepsake. Wow, I really like these sculptures on high stands. Hmm. Hey, Jan, come and have a look over here. These look like photographs etched into the glass. Hmm. What's that big table over there? There's bowls and pans and soup bowls. Wow, looks like there's water in them with needles on top of what looks like leaves. Hmm. Strange. Reminds me of Feng Shui. Hmm. Wow, look at that large photo with words on it. I wonder what that's about. Huh. I recognize where that is. That's a dump site. Jen, check these out. This one says pixels, lines, code, worker. Hmm, and Treaty 8. Oh, well, mine says flattened, silica, bitumen, arsenic. Gosh. That artwork over there, do you think it's finished? It doesn't look it. It must be. Mm hmm. I think this is another room. Wow. Ah, oh, look, there's a video and a pile of wood. I think they're broken chairs, Jen. There's a lot to consider in this exhibition. Yeah, we'll be looking and talking more about this artwork. Mm. Let's start here. These are a group of sculptures Will has made called Mountain Pose. Close up, can you see what they are made of? These are actually yoga mats. Will has hand cut each mat and pinned them together. Can you imagine how much time that took? I asked them that and I guessed years, but it didn't take him years because some university students gave him a hand. Can you see what these stacked yoga mats resemble? Let's look at the various layers and shapes.
These are mountain ranges. Each yoga mat represents an interval, or the difference in height, also called elevation, of the mountain ranges. So the more yoga mats you see, the higher the mountain range. The contour lines show both the elevation and the shape of the terrain or mountain. Have you heard of the Himalayas? Do you know where they are in the world? We would like you to look up the answer on a device. Willis created mountain ranges from the Himalayas in India. What famous mountain did you find when you were looking for the Himalayas? Did you get Everest? Mount Everest is the tallest mountain in the world. It's 29,029 feet, or 8.9 kilometers. No wonder it's really challenging to climb. That's extremely high and also cold. The cooler color mats are used for ranges found in the north and the warmer colors for the south. Cleverly, Will Kwan used colors that are related to warm and cool colors on the color wheel that match the climate and location of each range. What words would you use to describe this photo of the Himalayas, Jan? Gigantic, snowy, breathtaking, awe-inspiring. This image was doing the rounds on the news as residents in northern India are seeing the Himalayas for the first time in their lives. The mountains are usually obscured by some of the world's foulest air, but the coronavirus lockdown has triggered a drop in the country's notorious thick air pollution, making the mountains visible for the locals. Here's a key question for you. What could be the connection between the yoga mats and the mountains? Well, we helped you there. So you probably quickly got to a healthy yoga retreat in a mountain range. But why do some people want to go way up into the mountains to do the yoga? Okay, for those of you who might have said it was for a nice view, good for you. There are other health benefits. The air is cleaner and there are fewer distractions. You can go trekking. But Will Kwan's connection comes from the history of leisure pursuits for wealthy Europeans who would go up into the mountains at great cost because they believed it would make them live longer. And did it? No, not really. The fresh air is good, but overall, no. Have you ever tried yoga? How did it feel? I tried it once. It was very relaxing and it was good to take a break from my devices. Did you know yoga originated in India over 5,000 years ago? In 2019, 21% of Canadians said they practiced yoga. I bet lots more people have tried and are doing yoga at home since the lockdown. There are many videos on YouTube to follow if you want to try it. This artwork looks very different than Mountain Pose. Is it still Will Kwan's artwork? It is. It's called Water is Taught by Thirst. And it's a good example of contemporary art. It was made this year in 2020. It has a very deep and important message. It does. Let's investigate. Wow, it looks like neon lights. But isn't it supposed to be lit up like this sign? I wonder why it's not lit. What did you notice about it? Did you see all the hanging wires? The artist has deliberately left this artwork feeling unfinished. Who wishes to tidy it up and switch it on? I do. But you can't. How does that make you feel? Desperate, frustrated and slightly annoyed actually. Aha. Uh -huh. And that is also connected to the words, water is taught by thirst, which is also the first line of a poem by the same title, written by Emily Dickinson. Water is taught by thirst. Think about what that line might mean. The clue is in your description of how the art made you feel. 
I think you used the word desperate. In my mind, I pictured it an empty water glass. It's a very hot day. I wasn't thinking I was very thirsty until I saw that there was no water left. And I couldn't find any to fill the glass. There was just no water. All of a sudden, all I could think about was wanting water and nothing else and a feeling of total desperation. Has anyone else ever experienced that? I think having access to clean water is something we all take for granted. Does everyone in Canada have access to clean water? There are communities who do not. Many Indigenous communities don't. It's something that people are helping to change. So if you think about the line, the value of water can be taught by thirst. The less you have of it, the more important it is. We would like to introduce you to Amy Craft, who is an Anishinaabe Métis Indigenous lawyer who discusses the importance of water in her community in Manitoba. She has devoted much of her life and career to educating people about Indigenous worldviews. Water is an important, um, it's an important resource, but for Indigenous people, it has been, uh, and it is perceived to be life, um, and a way of life, an important part of who we are as people. Um, obviously, we come into the world through water, but in transport, um, we've traveled on water historically. And the place that I'm from uh, in Manitoba is we have water everywhere. Um, and it's, you know, we, we have looked historically at our waterways as uh, our highways and uh, an important means for connecting communities. And now when we look at the contemporary issues that affect Indigenous people and the issues that I've worked on in the last years, they're focused around water because of the impairment of our ability to have those healthy relationships with water. So from clean drinking water for First Nations and the inability to have clean drinking water um, or sanitation on reserve, boil water advisories to ideas of damming. Uh, in Manitoba, we have a long history of uh, hydroelectric development on the backs of First Nations communities, of Indigenous communities in northern Manitoba, to the point where in the 1970s, First Nations in Manitoba allied, them, uh, allied themselves and said, we need to negotiate a modern treaty, a resolution of all of these impacts that are happening because of hydroelectric development in our territory. And I think of you know the, the, the Winnipeg River in the south of Manitoba that has a series of seven dams on it that have fundamentally changed the landscape and the health of Indigenous people along that river, but have disconnected communities that are upstream and downstream and had such an impact on wildlife. So if we look at water, it's at the, at the source of all of the contemporary issues that um, indigenous people are dealing with, especially in relation to continuation of a traditional way of life or connection to lands and territories. And so water takes this important um, role in trying to advo advocate for a better life, to try and advocate for um, our ability to continue to sustain ourselves in our lands and territories and as indigenous people. So Amy says clean water access is an issue of living and breathing. It's an issue of environmental concern. It's also an issue with deep historical roots. Something has to be done. Let's think about what she was saying about the interconnectedness of water to Indigenous people for their ways of life as part of traditions passed down from generations and as an integral part of who they are as people. Can we make a visual using water to consider what is important in our own lives? Sure, grab a piece of paper, a pencil, some pencil crayons or markers. Let's start with a river in the middle of the page. Add your name on the river. Next, draw some tributaries, a river or stream flowing into the larger river. Try adding no more than five or six tributaries to your artwork. Tributaries flow into you and sustain your life. These are the things you need, not the things you want. 
Label each tributary with the things you need. We want you to think a little deeper than just food, water, and shelter. Here is what we came up with. See how we have used the word home to cover food, water, and shelter as one. Try to think of other, more meaningful things you need in order to live a happy and healthy life. Let's try something called a snowball toss. Teacher, fold up a piece of paper and give the paper to someone to start the toss. That student should read out a couple of words they used on their tributaries and then toss the ball onto another student. They will in turn read out a couple of their words and toss the snowball onto another student, moving the snowball around the class. Or, instead of a piece of paper, during these times, you can use an imaginary snowball for this activity. The next artwork is called Terra Economicus. You are looking at a pile of broken, painted Muskoka chairs piled up in front of a video of cottage country. What do you think is going on with the destruction of chairs contrasted with the video of pristine cottages? Did you think this was about the environment? Were your answers about building cottages on the land and taking away more of the natural environment? There is actually more going on here. It's specifically about lakes and a dispute with cottagers and indigenous people's traditional practices. Watch this video. A thousand years ago, our people lived on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean and prophets come to us and told us that we would move to the west. And the third prophet told us that we would live somewhere where the food grows on the water. Monoman is our sacred food, a gift from the Creator. Your mom and dad are out gathering manomen. When we get enough manomen, we can be assured that we have food on our tables. Our prophecies foretold our homelands and relationship with this food that will sustain us. Manomen foretells the health of our surroundings and sustains the relationship with creation. This monomen, which was prophesied, is the first food we eat. And it's also the last food we eat on our journey to that never-ending life. Monomen talks to me. It will talk to you as well. All that it asks of us is that we be grateful, that we be thankful. Nimi Gwichiwendam, Manomen. I am so grateful for the gift you provide to us.
What do you think the main arguments might be between cottage owners and Indigenous communities? What might each party not be happy with? This is something currently happening in Pigeon Lake and other lakes in Ontario. Wild rice, known as manumin by Indigenous people, has been planted on Pigeon Lake by a member of the local Indigenous community. Cottage owners are upset because the matured rice plants have changed the view of the lake and have made leisure water activities such as swimming and boating challenging. Some of the cottages have used machinery to destroy the manumin crops. Not all the cottages are new. Some of the cottagers have built the cottages themselves and have had them in the families for generations. Some plan to retire there. Indigenous communities argue that rice have been planted on the lakes for hundreds of years and it is an important tradition to keep and it is an integral part of their lives and communities. One of the Indigenous members has created a successful business selling the rice, creating jobs and economy. So we're going to do an activity. Divide the class in half, half of you of the cottages, the other half of the Indigenous community. Take a few minutes with your group to brainstorm. List all of the things that you are not happy about and the things that have long-term consequences for you. Present an argument to the other group to convince them that your point of view is the right one. Now talk about how you might resolve the situation. So we hoped you had reached some sort of compromise. Consider the fact the lakes in question have been debated for years and there will probably be more debates in the future about ownership. It is an opportunity to work with each other to find a resolution. Well done everyone. There is a play and a documentary about this story. You can watch it now on CBC. It's called Cottagers and Indians. And the broken chairs? I understand it now. The chairs might represent the broken relationship between cottagers and the indigenous community. Maybe. There could be more than one reason. This work is deep. Let's go back to the title. Terra economicus. That's a pretty fancy word. What does it mean? It's a reworking of the Latin words terra nullius, the term which means no one's land. No one's land? That kind of reminds me of a group of artists, the Group of Seven, who painted the Muskokas back in the 1920s. They believed that distinct Canadian art could be made by celebrating the beauty of land, which really never included people or homes. In fact, the Muskoka chairs you see were painted in the colour of one of the members, Lauren Harris's famous painting of Lake Superior. So why else might Will have broken up the chairs? Well, I think it's about how the Group of Seven have been criticised. The Group of Seven called the area untouched, or terra nullius. Well, we know that's not true. Indigenous communities have lived on the land for thousands of years before they were painted. There would have been villages with homes, churches, stores, and sacred sculptures. Yes, but the artwork they created was unlike anything else that was painted at the time. I think some people just got caught up in how they were painting, and not necessarily where they were painting, and what was said about the land being untouched. What do you think of the Group of Seven paintings? and their idea to paint the land untouched. So what about that annoying noise? What is it and why has Will added it to the exhibition? The sound you hear are the drones. They are what the real estate agents use to sell property, especially places that have lots of land with beautiful views. The sound is irritating. The video shows us very luxurious cottages, but for many of us, owning a cottage like these seems only a dream. 
It might be frustrating or annoying for those that don't have a cottage. Unlike water as a need in the water is taught by Thirst Artwork, do people really need cottages? Some would say yes. It's for relaxing, getting away from the city, away from the various distractions they may not have at home. Ah, so it's for mental health. That's a feeling I get when I read a book in a quiet corner of my home. It's like my getaway from things. Certainly, there are lots of ways people find moments for relaxation, like yoga. For other cottage owners, a cottage may be something that has been passed down from one generation to the next. Some people might call them family heirlooms, something to remind them of their family members of the past. I wish I could own a cottage and pass it down to my family members. Maybe I will one day. Do you have other aspirations in life? Maybe something you want to try, buy, or do in your lifetime. I'll tell you what, I wrote down a list of things I would love to do in my lifetime. Have you? Let's try this together. Each student, grab a piece of paper and a pencil. Divide your page into four sections. And then add things you want to try, like a hobby or a sport. Things you want to buy, but be reasonable. Things you'd like to do in life. Goals and adventures and places you would like to visit or live. Write down some ideas and of things that interest you. Okay, I've made my list. I'm going to hold on to it and see if I've accomplished any of these in the future. Great idea. Students, wouldn't it be great to check your own list and continue to add to it as you get older? Thank you for taking part in our interactive workshop. Feel free to come to the gallery and check out the exhibitions. We are open. You can extend this program by taking part in our online synchronous learning studio activity. For this studio project, we'll be using paint, chalk, oil pastels and other mixed media materials on canvas board. Book online to create a unique artwork that complements this session. Bye! Bye.